Welcome, everybody, on behalf of RU, and very, thank you very much for joining us on Thinking Feud Futures. Um, for us at RU, today's event marks the conclusion of a three-month uh, residency program, a thematic residency fo program focused around the question of the future of food. Just a little bit of a, back, a quick background and a few words about this initiative that we started at RU back in 2017 with a symposium that we um, hosted together with Parsons, the new school called Embedding Embedded Artist Residencies, um, Placemaking and Social Engagement. And um, in this particular symposium, we were looking to consider the important role that artists play in addressing the pressing issues of our time. Following that particular symposium, we felt that it was actually a really important aspect of artistic practice that as a residency program, we wanted to translate into practice. And we kicked off the residency program last year with Dirt and Debt, which was um, a three month residency that focused on um, artists who were working at the intersection of community ecology and soil. And then this year with uh, the Food Futures residency in which we sought to engage with this um, question of um, the way that um, the future of our food is in question because of questions of climate change, because of questions of the growing gap between re rich and poor, inequality, and access to food. Um, and lo and behold, we of course had no idea that the COVID-19 pandemic will be upon us. We had to move the residency program online. We're obviously hosting this event um, online at this moment. But it made this question of the future of food um, in many ways even more palpable and um, felt in ways that we might have known in the past how uh, food and access to food can be precarious. But with COVID-19, with uh, Black Lives Matters, with um, the growing rates of unemployment and how it impacts differently different groups in society and community, those questions I think have become ever more at the forefront of our everyday lives. Um, so, what we were doing through this residency is that we um, we, we emphasize this process, the, the, the importance of process as we were examining those questions. We're not, we were not so much concerned about whether we're producing a work of art per se, but rather how we together as artists and practitioners can come together to engage those kind of questions and be in conversations with experts in this particular field. Throughout the residency program, we had farmers come and speak to us. We had environmentalists um, speak to us. We had people coming from different parts of the world to engage with us, which was the kind of silver lining of hosting this residency online. And what we're hoping through um, today's engagement is just to give you a taste of what uh, the fantastic artists who have been engaged in this residency have been working on. And um, my colleague Ishin Anul, who is with us here, will continue in just a minute to tell you a little bit um, uh, more about what we have in mind as we move uh, forward. But before we do so, we all recognize the importance of acknowledging the various lines on which we, um, which we inhabit in our respective virtual spaces. And for that, we want to state that for, for more than 500 years, indigenous communities across the Americas have demonstrated resilience and resistance in the face of ongoing violent efforts to separate them from their land, culture, and each other. And although we're gathered today in a virtual space, many of us are physically based in cities and communities that are founded on expulsion, on inclusion, exclusion, 
my apologies, on exclusion and erasure of its native inhabitants who have stewarded the land for many centuries. We want to acknowledge that it is our responsibility and commitment to dismantle these ongoing legacies of settler colonialism in the US and elsewhere around the world, as it is our responsibility to dismantle all forms of racism, sexism, misogyny, and so on. We want to acknowledge that our homes are built on land that was violently taken from others. New York City, where Residency Unlimited is based, where my colleagues Ishin Onu and participating artist Lily Consuelo supporter Tadrieri, Yoko Inoue, Siri Lee, and myself all live, as well as Philadelphia and Princeton, which is the home of Rasa Nussbaum and Esra Durakan. New York City and those, uh, and Princeton and uh, Philadelphia is the ancestral land of the Lenope people. Um, fellow artist Andrew Vigil Emerson is based out of Tucson and Tucson is built on that land of the Tohono O'Dham and the Pasqua Yakoi people. So, Ishin, I think this is a good opportunity maybe to switch to you if you want to just say a few words um, about what we're working on and then we'll move on forward. Thank you very much, Livia, for the wonderful presentation of the project. I have been throughout the process always not only excited uh, about being a part of it, but also learning from all and each of the artists who are participants to this uh, project who have been uh, conducting truly interesting and important research that uh, what, what they will be presenting today is only a very small summary of it. But at the end of this residency, as Livia mentioned, we are aiming a public event, which was initially conceived as a uh, symposium, but due to the, the pandemic that we have been going through, we also turned this into an online event. But then we decided to use the possibilities that the online platforms, the virtual uh, technology uh, allows us. So the online event will not only be uh, panel discussions and presentations by the artists and the participants uh, throughout the residency, but also a, it will also function as a virtual exhibition platform for us. And it will allow us to share not only results, also, but also the process of the uh, research that the artists and all the pa uh, participants have been conducting throughout the residency. Uh, each participant will be presenting themselves briefly so that uh, you will also be able to uh, see them uh, before they start their presentations. Uh, we will go one by one, uh, each participant, and at the end you will be able to uh, pose your questions. We will ask you to uh, put those questions into the chat so that at the end of all the presentations the co uh, questions are collected. Each participant will be making a five minutes, approximately a five minutes uh, presentation. And at the end, we will have approximately a 20 minutes uh, discussion time. So we are looking forward to also hearing your comments and questions at the end of uh, these presentations. Uh, Livia, if you don't have anything else to add to this, we can start already with Siri Lee. Yes. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, I am Siri Lee, and as soon as um, my presentation is up, I'll just get right into it and introduce my most recent area of research, uh, the opium poppy. So I think we need to go to the first slide. Yeah, okay, no problem. Um, so yeah, this plant has cropped up in theaters of war across history and geography. And as it moves between time and place, I've been particularly interested in the way it has shifted in status from edible to poison to landscape in proximity to military and cultural wars. So what first drew me to the subject was recent news coverage of fentanyl and its imbrication in the US-China trade war. One of fentanyl's nicknames is China White because the majority of the US's illicit fentanyl supply comes from China. 
So in this arena, opioids are characterized unequivocally as a menace and instrument of foreign aggression. But what was particularly interesting about this to me was its mirroring of another historical precedent, the opium wars between the British Empire and China in the mid 19th century, which were fought when the Qing dynasty attempted to prohibit the British from smuggling vast quantities of opium into the country and ended in China's overwhelming defeat. Mainland Chinese history, oh, not yet. Uh, <laughs> mainland Chinese history has since depicted opium as the addicting imperialist venom that enervated the country and kicked off its century of humiliation at the hands of foreign powers, an era to end only once the Chinese Communist Party took over. So in my education, opium had no history prior to its wars, no status beyond one of poison. Next slide. But in reality, it turns out that before the 19th century, opium had been in China for thousands of years already. For the vast majority of its existence, it was used medicinally, ground, boiled, honeyed, infused, mixed with anything from ginger to caterpillar fungus, to treat anything from diarrhea to chronic coughs. It eventually also came to be used recreationally, and in the Ming Dynasty as an aphrodisiac in food, with cooks trying to stir fry opium and reconfigure its poppy seeds into a tofu substitute. It was only in the late 16th century, uh, when tobacco was imported from the New World, that the custom of smoking opium, made so infamous by the Opium Wars, actually began to develop. It was at this time that it gained the nicknames of Yang Yan, which means Western smoke, and Yang Tu, Western mud which were so odd to hear reversed in fentanyl's China White. But as it turns out, opium was also considered edible and medicinal rather than toxic in 19th century Europe and North America. Heroin was sold over the counter and morphine use was widespread, regularly fed to even infants. The most infamous example is Mrs. Winslow's Soothing Syrup, a wildly popular concoction for children advertised as perfectly harmless and very pleasant to taste, yet which contained high levels of morphine and alcohol. Morphine was only removed from the American recipe in 1915 with the beginning of the first wave of anti-drug legislation in the US, where we again see opium becoming a poison. And now an important piece of the background for this legislation were opium dens. As Chinese immigrants settled in the US uh, following the gold rush, which coincidentally was right around the same time of the second opium war, they were blamed for importing the opium smoking habit to the US and accused of luring and drugging innocent white women into their sin-filled opium dens. So as the US set the stage for its war on drugs, the poppy shed any material attributes as medicinal, culinary, or ornamental and instead became an elusive stand-in for other racialized and gendered populations. It became not an organism or material in itself, but rather a proxy of alien aggression. And at the same time, uh, African Americans were also being demonized as, quote, cocaine fiends and a new Southern menace, uh, so that the Harrison Narcotics Tax Act of 1914, the US's first major piece of anti-drug legislation, targeted opiates and cocaine, but really more as racial surrogates. And funnily enough, at the same time, Britain itself, a uh, grand perpetrator of the opium wars, along with its Australian colonies, were experiencing a yellow peril of their own, which featured a similar surge of opium peers. In the Australian poster on the left, you'll see that one of the tentacles of the so-called Mongolian octopus is opium. In the course of my research, I also discovered a third status of poppies as landscape. Afghanistan is responsible for 85% of the world's illicit opium supply, but it turns out that poppies first became an integral part of the landscape during a Cold War proxy, the Soviet-Afghan War of the 1980s, when their cultivation by Mujahideen uh, guerrillas was tacitly supported by the Reagan administration because the profits were used to buy weapons to fight the Soviets. The United States has since done an about face on its poppy policy and has thrown in the money to prove it, but the absolute lack of success has resulted in essentially a reversion to the stance of tolerance and even support. Which is why you can have these fascinating sorts of photographs. They remind me of another Cold War landscape, the Vietnam War, where you had American soldiers um, similarly militarized yet camouflaged yet wholly out of place in otherwise gorgeous tropical jungles of Vietnam. Um, so at this point, I'm not yet sure what 
artistic form my research will ultimately develop into, but in the meantime, I'll leave you with a return to the poppy as edible. In the US, despite the overdose crisis, opium poppies are still not entirely illegal to plant. Officially, everything is prohibited except the poppy seeds, which are used in baked goods, are pressed to make oil for painting and cooking. But ornamental gardening of opium poppies is widespread enough to be difficult to police. Just on Amazon, you can buy opium poppy seeds. So who knows, maybe that will be my next step. Thank you. Thank you, Siri, for this very informative, wonderful talk. Thank you. We will be back, I'm sure, with a lot of questions. Meanwhile, we will continue with uh, Andrew Vigil Emerson, Emerson and uh, Rosa Nussbaum together. Um, and while I'm um, picking the file, Livia, the word is yours. So, Andrew Vigil Emerson and Rosa Nuss Nussbaum will present to us space switches. Space witches draw their power from their relationship to gender, land, and reproduction. Now they've taken to the sky to reposition themselves in the universe and to rewrite their histories and futures using food, land, and the queer and female erotic. Must come, must come to the banquet, to the banquet of, bitterness. of bitterness. Before there were the commons, and everything was shared. With apologies, I will show another version of it because it's got star. Sorry for this. You, you must come, come to the banquet of bitterness. Before there were the commons and everything was shared. But after the enclosure, we had to travel to inner space. So hi, I'm everybody. Oh, good. Okay. Um, just a quick question. Did that actually, did the video actually play for people? Yes? Yeah. Okay, you had the experience. No, some people are saying no. Okay, at the end of the session, I will actually post the link because Zoom is very unreliable with video playing. So uh, yeah, I'll post the video link in the chat. Um, but over to you, Andrew. So hi, I'm Space Witch Andrew, and this is Space Witch Rosa, and we just hi. want to talk a little bit about how we got to this project. Yeah, um, so Ishan, do you have the presentation up? Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, oh, that, I can see it. All right, and then this is presenting. Beautiful. All right, so um, I think we're going to start about talking about um, how we came to witches. And really, we came to witches through this idea of, um, you know, uh, Lydia at the beginning of the talk mentioned that we had a lot of people coming in speaking about land, speaking about how food and futures are created out of the actual soil and the land. Um, and so they, they're talking, they were talking a lot about uh, indigenous histories of the land, but also sort of ecolog ecological ideas of the land. Um, and so the real thought was about how do we create a future um, in this world that is built on sort of patriarchal expansionist colonialism um, and at that time I was reading uh, this book 
Caliban and the Witch by Sylvia Federici. Yeah, wonderful. Um, and so uh, Federici really explains and goes into what it's like for um, what the history of, of witchery really meant in Europe. And so the, the history in Europe of witches has been very intertwined with um, the history of land grabbing and of capitalist appropriation of land. Uh, so they were actually a lot more in the Middle Ages. There were many more lands that were common lands that were tilled by uh, common people together and held in common, stewarded in common. And so what um, the sort of proto-capitalist class did was they uh, used um, capitalist logics to expropriate uh, those lands and uh, blame people for being terrible witches. And that's why we have to burn them and take away their rights and their property. This is a very sort of classic pattern. Um, yes, and so, so we we're thinking, you know, what if we could go back to that actually feminized and, uh, and uh, gendered source of, of power instead of that being a moment of destruction in history, of that actually being a way forward into thinking about the logic for the future that isn't in the mold of um, how we've been seeing the future in a sort of SpaceX sending a giant space penis into space way. Um, but is actually, so you can see in this drawing, um, I was trying to think about, so this is the witch being burnt in the center, um, but instead of it actually being a witch burning, there's like a, a broom that goes down towards the center of the earth and she's traveling into inner space. So it's this actual witching that goes forward into inner space. And so um, there's this idea that the witches, instead of going away, have been, been hibernating and trying to go into a, a type of future. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, um, and so this is my first sort of drawing of what a space witch might look like, and um, this is a slightly more elaborated version, the next slide, of uh, how that might come to be, and maybe more elaborate costume, and that's all sort of a bit more represented in this trailer for the video that will be, be longer, um, and just to sort of point towards uh, some inspirations for this. Obviously, there are other artists who have worked very, very well and very like powerfully and excitingly in imagining uh, a, a, a future that is um, less discriminatory and less awful, and especially uh, people like Sun Ra um, in, in uh, Space is the Place, really sort of uh, pushing forward that Afrofuturist um, way of thinking. We're very much indebted to that. Um, Andrew, do you want to? So, next slide. Oh, sorry. Uh, also, uh, that was a picture of the costume. I, I forgot to tell you, that's what it looks like. Yeah. So, <laughs> coming into this residency, uh, I was looking at how queer experience can be a way to map out and see change in the future. So before I get started, I just want to read a quote from a book, uh, Queer Phenomenology, Orientation, Objects and the Other by Sarah Ahmed that really inspired this residency for me. If we know where we are when we turn this way or that, then we are oriented. We have our bearings. We know what to do to get to this place or to that place. To be oriented is to be torn towards certain objects, those that help us find our way. These are the objects we recognize so that when we face them, which we know which way we are facing. They might be landmarks or other familiar signs that give us our anchoring points. They gather on the ground and they create a ground upon which we gather. So coming into this residency, we were already repositioning and reunderstanding how it would function with our practice and this idea of the future of food. So stepping into this, I create desire to create this virtual space in my kitchen using projector screens so I could engage the queer community and queer story in a way that would still allow us to document these moments and understand the future without risking COVID. Next slide. So in one of these conversations with uh, a close friend of mine in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a gay Satanist, he started sharing recipes and he would present ingredient lists and ways to make food and we would teach each other recipes over this projector screen. And in one instance, I was surprised in the way in which we were able to send information and understanding on recipes, things that weren't written on these guest checks or these notes, but ways in which we pass knowledge. And in being positioned in Tucson instead of New York, like we originally planned, I looked towards my region and our histories here to ways to understand where we're coming from in connection to land in the future. And part of this came with this power of the marginal erotic and the ways in which we hold energy in marginal spaces and can use that to empower the future. 
And in one conversation with Ali, she talked about the constructions of previous cookbooks and how cookbooks geared for women at this time excluded specific explicit information because it was understood that women would know this and it was an affront to write this out verbally. And it further demonstrated the ways in which you know, we hold these, another way in which we hold these knowledges and we use that to create new lines and new futures. Next slide. So in this, I was looking at how can I understand my own lines and the ways in which I am as a queer person directing these and creating moments for future and passing this power and understanding. And so I started looking at these objects of uh, belts and how to physically manifest and hold ingredients as this entry point for myself and other people to come around food and then create these futures and these instances. And this led us, next slide, to this intersection with Rosa, this idea of the banquet of bitterness, how we can look at our positioning and these ideas of ingredients and food and what physically tastes bitter, what does, that, what does bitter mean as a moment, a memory, how it phrased on an exterior can be a very diminishing phrase, but it can be also these markers of important moments in our lives and our histories, way, moments that were formative that taught us about the world and which shaped our future. And so Rosa can pick up a little bit more about what we mean and what we're looking at for the Banquet of Bitterness. Yeah, so with the Banquet of Bitterness, the, the thinking really is to try and, um, try and like reach into the power of that feeling of, of being wrong, that feeling of uh, a history of pain and of, um, of disappointment and being able to, to bring that forward into the future instead of having to, you know, have a, ha having a hyperfeminized sweetness, like the idea of a witch, witches are not just, you know, happy and cheerful and upbeat, witches curse people and they have, they have this connection to, um, to the darker side of things as well. And I think there's a real power in that. So uh, the, one of the sort of core strains of the um, banquet of bitterness, next slide please, um, is this idea that we could that this could be something that brings together uh, not just narratives of productivity and fecundity but also narratives of waste and narratives of unproductivity and things that are outside of the margins um, and one of the sort of important strains of the banquet of bitterness is also bringing the non-humans who are often accompanying us in our journey towards <laughs> having you know, literal food on our table to the table. Um, so there's like a bunch of cockroaches you can see and uh, a mouse that's being caught in a mouse trap. And so those are going to be characters in the bank of the business going forward. Next slide, please. Um, and I have a, I have a sort of, I mean, for those of you who saw the video in better quality, you saw this, but there's a, there's a lot of cockroach imagery where I'm trying to, to get on with my, my fear of cockroaches, but also they, they are incredibly resilient. I and mean, cockroaches are some of the few animals that actually been to space. Um, so this is a, a picture of the cockroaches that uh, the Russian space agency um, took to space in the Soviet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a, a, a zombie mouse, which is a, a mouse that has been trapped and uh, still keeps living in, in the afterlife. So there's a sort of permeable boundary between life and death and eating and being eaten. Um, and so that we are either have familiars or are familiar with that group of non-humans. Next slide. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a more detailed illustration of a space cockroach. And so we're, and we're, we're trying to like really make this world as real as we can to really ideate towards a future um, that is, is in, um, embodied and like weird and funny and silly, but is really more material in this way. And Andrew's actually been working on, on, on producing something next slide um, so, to, to, to make that future real yeah so if you could go uh, this one's out of order so if you can go to the last slide and then this slide so if you could go to the oh yeah perfect so one of the things i've been working on is ways in which we can you know document our experiences and record and use these as points for the future and so one of the projects i've been doing is creating these queer cookbook journals to pass along as a tool for people to document their own experiences and their this moment of time. And then if you can go to the other side. And so one of the things Rose and I have been looking at is as we create 
this fantastical world and as we are you know, understanding these personal moments in our lives, there's also parallels to you know, Western notions of magic, queer chaos magic. There's, it's founded in our different ideas of witches, of magic, of embodied knowledge. And part of our goal was to allow ways to engage with this world from the different perspectives of the different experiences we have. And so we're to realize this future from this event uh, coming up to our fall symposium. We will be sending out different rituals, different recipes, and these uh, space witch journals and some space witch grimoires as ways for us to, as a diverse group of people, relate to each other and use our relationships and our experiences to manifest these food futures and these futures we desire and hope for out of uh, continually repositioning. Thank you. Thank you for your channel. Did you bring one, Andrew? What? Did oh, yeah. I, so I have one here and there's a bunch of other designs spaced off of Rose's World that will be coming up. So check out our Instagrams and we'll keep you updated. Thank you. Wonderful. So thank you so much to Rosa and Andrew for this um, very insightful presentation and us prodding us to think about um, cockroaches and um, bitterness. But um, so without further ado, we will move on to Yoko. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Yoko Inoue. Now, I'm thinking about the intimacy of our bodies with different continents of the world and in their colonial histories and uh, through food and in its relationship to politics of land and ownership. You have to go to the first slide. This is in oh, the middle. Sorry. Yeah, and then, you know, we live in a <laughs> capitalist system, but that served me to embrace the, embrace the placeness of the food that I consume and, you know, feel comfortable in it but I no longer taste the soil of the place, which smells like my culture. So I hear constructions in New York City, but no people, no music, no people, no food. Now we are all here and inside. So I have the next slide. Yes. Um, okay, take you to the journey. Land sovereignty in mind. I thought of mapping of the field of the food. I am not a geographer to assess the biophysical properties of the land, soil, waterways, or vegetations. Rather, I was thinking of human interactions with the environment and interrelations of the distant places which are out of my consciousness. In her book, Undermining, a wild ride through land use, politics, and art in changing West. Lucy Lippard talks about gravel pits and colonial construction of the land of New Mexico. Dozing off, but simultaneously awakening from the atomic amnesia, my eyes were searching for the open pits of uranium extractions a photograph found in the archive of the Los Alamos Historical Society. Atomic cake was an edible monument commemorating the Operation Crossroad in Bikini Atoll, 1946. A series of nuclear bombs testings on the stolen land of the United States and in the contested territories of the Pacific Ocean. When celebrating the power of public weapons, the cake had to be as monumental as the mushroom clouds, a spectacle of conquering an enemy and nature. But who are the ones still holding on to the most painful nuclear memories today? I intended the cake as something to eat, the chef of the atomic cake said. Ingredients, white flour, white sugar, butter, cream, pineapples, chocolate. We know the production of this food can be critiqued from the field of human geography and political economy, land grabs, slavery, 
and unfair trade. Can we imagine how the, this monument tastes like? And tasted like? In geographies of race and food, field, bodies, markets, Rachel Slocum says, hunger can never be blamed on drought or epidemics, but it is produced as necessary implications of the racist structure of transnational ownership of land and geopolitics. American Airlines flight number 5777 on January 6, 2020. I had not heard anything about coronavirus. The racist human cost is rarely mentioned in food. And what does that have to do with food and with the nuclear weapon programs. Hydroelectric power refrigeration and fossil fuel transportation. Los Alamos National Laboratory is the US Department of Energy, which surveys atmosphere, land, ocean, and now is conducting research on COVID-19 vaccine. I collaborated with Karen, a wedding cake chef, to replicate the atomic cake. She's a Navajo woman. I am ignorant about the histories of Indian removal and various treaties, but now beginning to see how the food has to do and has to be understood from the framework of geopolitics. How can I take down this monument? I intended this cake as something to be consumed by me, fed by white Americans. This is of the public land to private corporations for the extraction of uranium, oil, gas, are examples of congressional failures to protect indigenous heritage and subsistence living. Do you know what yellow cake is? Yellow cake, the ox oxidized powder, is the first step towards enriched uranium used for nuclear power plants and bombs. In the United States, the uranium extraction has been concentrated in the mining district of Grants, New Mexico, now mostly abandoned along with radioactive waste. The Karen's brother worked in Grant's underground mining site, the Navajo Nation's deadly legacy of contaminated land and water and associated cancer disease continues. Find a woman from the Navajo Nation to bake a yellow cake. Keep out, it's dang dangerously delicious. But what is the real cost and taste of this cake? On January 30th, the WHO declared a global health emergency. It's interesting to think about the invisible particles of virus as threats, like radiation. Mapping fears, the starting point was baking mud cakes and eating dirt lick, chew, swallow, or spit it out. But I don't trust this soil. But then, how can I trust any food grown in these soils? So where are our land futures? So thank you so much. And this is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, Yoko, for such a moving presentation. I'm sure that many people will have a lot of questions for you about it. Um, we're going to move next to Ali. Great, Allie. thank you. Um, my name is Ali Wist, and I'll be speaking about some works in progress on the idea of place and smell and landscapes. Um, Hold on just a second. Okay. 
Um, my name, or I'm sorry, <laughs> my work relates to time scales, memory, and how we process change over time. I think our future represents an opportunity for our bodies to become sources of knowledge, to commune with food and plants and non-humans, to learn about our present, to learn about our past. I want to start by asking, how do you remember a place? It's not the facts of the place. It's not the floor plan or the dates you went there. That doesn't really get at what's meaningful, and that place remains enclosed, veiled. But facts are how history tries to remember place and time. We quantify the past. It's a white and Western dogma that facts are the most valid way to articulate the past and talk about change over time. We miss the shadows and the contours of difference. This is also how we have been trying to understand places that are changing because of climate change, using maps and data to get at how this past will look to future generations. But these facts won't let us press our hands into what was lost, let alone pay attention to the change happening right now. And the stakes are high. The damage to the environment grows severe. Cutting down our notions of nature versus civilization has only laid bare the grief that we have brought. We are prone to forgetting. Every one of us is suffering from a condition called generational amnesia. Humans are so adept at forgetting change that over generations we lose track of it entirely, like the frog in the water that is boiling slowly. In the future, we might accept polluted landscapes, degraded soil, and mass extinction as normal. Without some intimate memory or experience of past environments, we won't actually have the ability to perceive what's lost. So what is a method for alleviating generational amnesia, for noticing? I propose smell. Smells aren't given much validity as, the his as historic records for data keeping, especially um, you know, degraded in social and academic importance between the 16th and 20th centuries. But I argue they may be a better way to access the past, to preserve our present for the future. Because of COVID, I've been cut off from smells behind masks and plexiglass, plastic shielding neutered air, stripped of scent, lest we inhale. And I came to this as a form of knowing to account for places and engagements in a non-cerebral way and started to explore. I tried to host smell shares with my friends so they could describe the smell of their foods to me. I tried hosting a meditation to imagine the smell of a future farm stricken by drought. In a studio visit with artist Miriam Samoon, she encouraged me to try to capture the scents themselves. And so these are the beginnings of works in progress, experiments for now, uh, trying to preserve the scent of landscapes that could be gone because of climate change. Smell artifacts of Red Hook, the Rockaways, other shorelines that could be completely underwater due to sea level rise. It'll take months to properly get all of the scents. A variety of plants can be com combined to make a place. Eau de Red Hook. I've collected dirt. I don't know what dirt perfume will be like, but we'll see. Um, dirt and plants, invasive and native and decorative. False delineations, really. Once combined, they change, become something else. I've also tried to preserve the smell of wild edible plants growing in the Hudson Valley. The USDA publishes maps that show areas where certain plants can grow and thrive has been shifting northward over the past few decades. Of course, we have to wonder if plants may grow in different places. We may take common, place, common plants for granted. Commonality will change. But perhaps with this, we can be unstuck from linear time and come back, stay with the ephemeral. For many people, food is our most intimate interaction with the environment, via agriculture, and even mushrooms, which may help keep our soil alive. I tried to grow an oyster mushroom and failed and tried to preserve its smell. Um, how much can we remember in a society that loves to forget? The smell of melted iron washed up on a beach, the smell of discarded plastic. 
Instead of holding a fragile vase from our past, let it shatter into perfume, radiant moments tucked inside time. Taken together, maybe there is a future museum or bank like the Svalbard Seed Bank that can hold them and gives us an embodied experience, a messy, muddy topography of smell. But how can we imagine the space as inclusive, one that acknowledges indigenous relationships and also their forms of knowing? In October at the symposium, I'll show an extension of this work, a journey with the mushroom through layered spaces and smell. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, so we are now going to go forward with Esra. Um, sorry, I'm kind of, you can see I'm, you can see when I'm losing my train of thought. So my apologies. <laughs> Ezra, please go ahead. Yes, I, hi, my name is Ezra and I'll be uh, showing my research and collaboration on cakes and architecture. Welcome everyone, thank you for coming. I'm representative of Ezra's Mini Mini Cake Architecture & Co. We build buildings together, we play, we chat over baking, cakes, and our environments. All you need to do is say yes, prepare your apron, and get ready to play. Today I'm going to talk about a little bit of history of our studio, our design process, and what's been baking. I use cakes as a way of both reacting to the frustration in architectural education, also frustration during pandemic and how control of everything is taken out of my hands. Everything started because of this man and his work, Maria Anton Krem. This person who invented the pastry, um, pastry world happens to be an architect. He used to go to the library, study monuments and make them out of his art, pastry. Every time he replicated, he edited something and changed it to make it his. Eventually, he moved away from the replicas and created new forms, new cakes, and new recipes. Obviously, these cakes are done in professional, uh, but done by professionals with unlimited budgets in giant kitchens. They meant power, queens and kings, and perfection, the opposite of what our cakes are looking for. And perhaps for that reason, ours look, act, and act differently. The idea of our cakes also started by replicating architectural monuments. Think about replicating not to get as close as the original, but as a way of editing out the original. And in my case, abstracting the architecture to make it more chunky, colorful, and more friendly. After everything shut down in March 2020, all my plans on my cake event got canceled, but I had a ridiculous idea that shifted everything. The idea was making a cake with friends from different parts of the world. They might be architects or not. They might be good baker bakers or not. As long as they're down, they're in the game. I picked these monuments and rethought them in digital. To give the bakers as clear information as possible, I wrote recipes attached with architectural drawings. These drawings called construction documents, which means that they are super clear so both the engineer and the workers who are building can produce exactly what's planned. On the other hand, I've never baked a proper structural cake, but I studied architecture. And if cakes were architecture once, then I can pull it off. This is what architects do. You look at other projects that got built and assume that yours uh, won't fall apart as well. The construction documents were never used. Instead, these drawings were really helpful because they gave freedom to bakers. My plan was making a cake town from cakes that I collaborated with the home bakers. This was my vision and I thought I would more or less get a similar um, baked city from my friends, but then I got this. So close yet too far. In the perfect functioning world, I was going to give the renders to a professional baker and have a beautiful and fun event where I feed people with my architectural cakes and probably close the cake project and move, move on. 
Now, one thing that still makes me question and gets excited is this new Cape Town. During this residency, I did something I never do, which is doing nothing. Not um, going forward, not pushing the project, but just looking at them, re-looking and re-looking with the artists. Perhaps now it's time to move out from the Cape Town and find another one or not. But if you want to come with us also, just let me know. Thank you. Thank you so much, Esra. <laughs> it's so fascinating to see, you know, your project in comparison or non-comparison, but next to Yoko's in terms of this thematic engagement with the cake as a symbol and a trope and in such different applications. And I'm sure that many people will have questions for both of you. So we are going to move now to our last presenter, Lily Consuelo, supporter, Tadrieri. Hello, um, my name is Lily Consuelo Supporter Tajiri, and I'm an industrial designer and eco-futurist based in Brooklyn, New York. Um, so as an industrial designer and eco-futurist, my work preempts emerging ecological circumstances. The majority of my work culminates in something tangible, actionable, often a gathering or a meal. Under different circumstances, I would be feeding you as we spoke. Over the past few months, as we've been grappling with loss and revolution, the desire to share and feast in community has felt vital and like the missing solve to the hurts and growing pains. So today, instead of feeding you, I will walk you through a few of the questions I've been grappling with and I invite you to contemplate them with me in the chat. So if you wanna answer the questions in the chat, that's um, there for you to do. I will also tease you with descriptions of what I would feed you in the hopes that in the future, through recipes, we will cook apart but eat together. Welcome to this virtual meal. Yashin, if you'll go to the next slide. Oh, perfect, thank you. Question one, how do we ensure food autonomy in a precarious food landscape? Sprouted seed bread, radish green pesto, charred leeks and micro mustard greens with a drizzle of hot pepper honey jam, served with apple cider. All of these foods can be grown in your windowsill out of food scraps or seeds you might otherwise discard. This question is huge, but the simplest start to respond has been the recognition that we can all grow food. First off, save your scraps. You can regrow leeks, lettuce, radish, and a bunch of other things in water. Secondly, save your seeds. Go to the next. Um, especially if they're heirloom. Um, and saving a range of um, seeds ensures that the future is biodiverse. Each seed comes from a lineage of plants linking us to the past and represents a legacy to come. If well maintained, the squash I plant today could be re related to a squash I grow 50 years from now. Little packets of life, seeds can travel for miles and years until they encounter the right condition to emerge. And when kept safe, they can stay locked up for years before they venture to sprout. This year, for the first time in my lifetime, there were seed shortages in the US. Seeds signify autonomy in a moment of food precarity. And through investing and caring for them, we create an anchor of hope into the future, something we desperately need in times of uncertainty. If you've ever eaten something you planted or reaped what you sowed, it feels like an epiphany that somehow with just a little sun, water and dirt, something fragrant, fleshy and nutritious emerges. If you save seeds year to year, they begin to change and adapt to your soil. They become an archive of conditions in your shared relationship. Um, sorry. Froze. Question two. How do we make sure every, everyone is accounted for, especially for non-human neighbors? Bowl of mixed seeds, including millet, sunside where you can see it. Daylily flowers stuffed with sweet peas and mint. Salted pepitas, nasturtiums, and pansies served with lavender, fig juice. Am I frozen? No, okay, I'm frozen on my own screen. Um, all of these foods support pollinators and birds. By growing them, you are serving both you and your winged neighbors. 
Um, I have been making bird feeders out of recycling to hang on my fire escape and have, an, have edible flowers as a treat for me and the pollinators. Um, yeah. Can you go to the next slide? Um, and you can go again, <laughs> sorry. Okay, question three. What if we got the best case scenario of our wildest imaginations? What would it look like, taste like, smell like, feel like? I really want you to contemplate this. Um, heirloom corn polenta cake with honey from my neighbor's rooftop bees, strawberries grown on the fire escape, fennel rosebud jam foraged, mixed fruit from my mother's garden in a bowl to gather the pits served with honey, sumac tea, and sweet sea salt perfume. These foods are grown in community, foraged, found, and in support of a healthy ecosystem. The honey represents thriving pollinators and the sea salt perfume, a hope that rising seas can be contained or transformed into something less threatening. In a big way, in the macro level, my dream these days is for community gardens to be open to the public. My dream is for dismantling of police and reallocation of funds to legitimate public services. My dream is for neighborly love and the sharing of resources. My dream is for healthy ecosystems and for us to stop burdening them. My dream is for co-inhabiting spaces with other living creatures. My dream is to share meals with strangers and nourish each other. I'm going to continue to consider these questions and the others that I didn't have time to share. Um, with the hope that we can meet in person in a few months and I can serve you some of these foods. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Lily. And um, Ishin, do you want to say a few words? Uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you. Uh, as I said, um, at the very beginning, we are learning from each, each of you a lot. So I'm sure everyone uh, wants all these texts uh, to be available because each of them are full of information and this collective knowledge that is and the concern and speculations about the future and an understanding of the past that is offered here throughout uh, through these projects are, are deeply important, especially at this very moment that we are in because uh, each of you are also asking questions about how to change certain things. And ending with your presentation, dear Lily, that is not simply about specul speculations, but also uh, uh, the subtle changes that we can do in our lives today can mm -hmm. actually provide certain changes in the very uh, recent future. So uh, all of these questions were deeply important. I wonder if we have uh, collected any questions from our audience right now. Um, if you are interested in, please uh, ask, uh, pose your questions on this uh, chat so we can uh, collect and start our discussions. Um, well, alternatively, if you want to just raise your hand in the kind of chat uh, space on your this, I will be monitoring to see if anybody is like raising their hand. So we exactly. can give you the video, so to speak. Yeah, feel free to turn on your video and simply just uh, join the discussion if you prefer. So while you're thinking about questions, I mean, one of the things that, you know, I've been working with uh, the um, with, with you guys, residents in residence um, since the beginning. And one of the things I think that we all have been grappling with throughout this residency is this feeling of loss of control. And in the way that food, the way it's translated in our practice uh, of, um, and I can't remember who in a presentation was mentioning this feeling of, of loss of control, but at the same time also letting go of control and this kind of tension of like needing it both, the needing to feel that um, not everything is slipping away, but at the same time, the change and change in our food system and change in how we're thinking about food comes through this letting go of control. So I think that's kind of an important aspect for us to consider in terms of like how, how does food um, 
translate into those kind of questions. And thinking, for example, Siri, in your practice, in a way that we're thinking about the control of the body and what goes in, right, in terms of especially abusive substances. Um, we spoke in other aspects of like bulimia and, and eating disorders, but at the same time also um, political control, right, wars, and how that translates into trade wars and how it translates into political wars. Um, and I think that those questions are also relevant, for example, in Yoko's work, right, in terms of atomic bomb and then how it feeds into our soil and what we eat. And this kind of question is, you know, do I eat or don't I eat from this soil? Can I trust this soil? But at the same time, the no choice, because otherwise we actually cannot eat. Um, and then feeding into Andrew and, and, and Rosef's presentation about this, like, the, almost this need to kind of eject ourselves out to, into space in order to come back and inhabit space in a more equitable way um, and creating those spaces. And I really appreciate th this idea of thinking about the concept of bitterness because we tend to think of bitterness in this negative sense, right? It's like, ooh, bitter, I don't want to eat that. Especially in a, in a negatively, like uh, gendered negatively sense, you know, that bitter woman Exactly, and how it relates to the concept of the witch, right? The woman as a witch and the witch hand, etc. And I want to introduce Rosa, who is out of her outfit now, and we can recognize you, Rosa, in person. <laughs> so a shout out to Rosa. Um, and again, to go back to Rosa, uh, to um, Esra's presentation in terms of how you're weaving in and out this question of like buildings and monuments, um, but in a, in a playful way, uh, but at the same time that digs at the heart of kind of systems of power and of control and how we think about our built environment. And especially if we translate architecture into real estate, right? In, in, in New York City, which is, it's all about that. It's all about power and money and control. And then um, finally to kind of, um, yeah, Rosa. I think someone has a, has a comment. When you're yeah. done, you might want to pick up. Yes, <laughs> well, I'm sorry, I'm like on my little thing. I just want to kind of like, just weave my kind of um, a few thoughts together. Um, now, where was I? Hang on. Oh, Ali's um, thinking about, um, again, the way that our senses actually reconnect us to place. Um, and the way that Lily is thinking about how seeds connect us to, um, to our space, to our built environment, but also to our communities and how we're all coming together through um, these kind of connectors. And in that way, I think that there's a lot in common between food and art in this almost banal way, but in a very real and concrete way, that these are the things that bring us together as people and as communities. And this is where we find strength. We find strength in each other and we have the strength to make the changes that we feel need to be made. Um, so let me just, um, Rosa, do you have that question instead of me trying to? Oh, it was, um, Shao was writing to, to everyone saying, um, I think we as a group should start creating a smell museum, but tie it to experience. Like what smells were typical in the 90s and the 80s, etc. So I think this might be one for Ali especially. Ali, we can't hear you for some reason. I need this. Um, <laughs> There is, my sister was telling me that there is actually a perfume museum um, and there are some attempts at smell museums, but they're kind of either focused on perfumes um, or this sort of like decade time period approach. So like, what did the late 1800s smell like? Um, and there have been some experiments, but smell just isn't taken that seriously in like a museum setting, whether it's for like uh, in terms of contemporary art or, you know, actual historic objects. So I feel like it's, it's a rarity, but that would be really cool to just smell the 80s. <laughs> Andrew, is there's also a, a nice episode of 99% Invisible, the podcast about um, the history of smells in the 20th century and how women were meant to smell. Going from very funky to very clean, which is interesting.
Are there any other kind of, any other questions from uh, the audience? I have one for uh, Rosa and Andrew. Please go for it. Um, I just wanted to, I, I love this idea of um, witches taking over the, the commons that we have left, that space and making it not this technophilic space. Uh, and I guess I was wondering uh, more specifically about the bitterness, just what if you have thoughts about um, the history of bitterness and culture and like similar to how we have valued or not valued space, like how have we valued or not valued that flavor over um, sweetness, over umami, over other kind of flavors or tastes? Andrew, do you want to go first? I've been talking a lot. Oh, no, feel free to start off. I'll jump on in. Um, I was actually recently uh, given this book, which is a cookbook specifically about bitter flavors, um, which I thought was very fascinating. And it's kind of the the, uh, the first time I've, I have seen that. And there really is like, the things in the book all look almost like witch recipes. You know, I mean, you think about even just like, like the color of things that are bitter are often sort of darkish, purplish things, or you have kind of sort of astringent flavors that are almost like, like acquired and unpleasant. Um, so, so there's this, this idea that something is almost like, like off and complicated about them. Um, so I think that's, that's really exciting. I think we, we want to do more like research into doing a concrete ingredients list so we can have real recipes for the fall, where we can have a real banquet that, that is somehow uh, uh, being manifested in the, in the books that Andrew is making as well. And one of the things we've been thinking about with like the how bitterness exists as it's parallel to memory and time is like bitterness is marked as this very poignant, this very sharp indicator of a palate, of a meal, even a breakfast with like a black cup of coffee. But in these specific dense moments, you have these rich intersections of perspective and histories around what makes this and what you know, brings together this bitter flavor. And then there's these same things in our experience if we look at how these are different intersectional identities are complexly interwoven, but they place us in these different, you know, between these different categories, these different, you know, lineages, like looking in the Southwest, you know, the, what people can find representation in can often be about one experience that is fading an archetype and Outside of it, there is this like erasure of history and erasure of time. And so in these complex moments and these sharp, you know, inside outside experiences, you find the same kind of concentration of bitterness as ways of marking our own past and the people around us and also marking these very poignant reference points and foods. And there is this like marriage, right? In, in sweetness and bitterness, where we talk about things being bittersweet and the sense that like, things that from our past that we can look to that are pleasant and pleasurable um, that have have been infused by a bitterness in a literal way. So I don't know, just remembering things that my mum burnt when I was little and they were like sweet, like like rice, like sweet rice, what do you call it? Uh, rice pudding. Um, and you ha like have that like strong burnt bitter inflection into something that is sweet, that is very, very literal. And there's this like sense of <laughs> a waste of memory and of a combined sweetness and bitterness in that emotion as well. I think I would also add to it in the way mm. that to me this also resonates um, so strongly with what Siri is um, looking at in terms of those hierarchies of, um, and, and again also relates to Ali, the hierarchies of our senses, right, in terms of um, what we consider as preferable to another, that um, taste is preferable to smell in terms of how we record things, but the whole, also how they're culturally coded. And I was thinking especially of some of the conversations that we had throughout the residency in terms of um, the um, um, certain um, um, stereotypes or certain associations that became very apparent with COVID-19 about the wet markets in China, right? And maybe, Siri, you could say just a few words about how your thinking about your work changed as a result of 
of COVID-19 and some of those kind of racial stereotyping that you were dealing with in your work? Um, so I guess for me, what happened when um, the coronavirus pandemic exploded was immediately this focusing on US-China relations, which is kind of what kicked off um, sort of my whole interest in opium poppies. But initially it was, um, yeah, it was this, all this rhetoric about the double standard about wet markets um, as being like particularly unsanitary places, even though I had previously never even really thought of them as such. I, they were, and you have wet markets in Chinatown as well. So I, for me, what happened then is with the rhetoric about calling it like the Chinese virus, it just led me to really focus on the sort of flaring of US China tensions. And that then led back into another sort of um, explosive disease of the US opioid epidemic. Um, so it was this sort of, in a way, what the, 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 um, the surging of one pandemic led me to kind of focus onto another one um, through the sort of the connotations of US China relations. I was also thinking about this, uh, this parallelity between coming back to uh, bitterness and memory, which is also visible uh, in Yoko's work, uh, but also somehow in Ezra's work. What I find interesting that, uh, especially you, Rosa, Andrew, uh, choosing this childlike uh, illustrative sort of language, uh, almost fairy tale like uh, language, also gives us another connection not only to memory but also to time and experience and learning and and i think bitterness is also something to learn how to take pleasure of throughout our time and perhaps um having more and more bitter experiences we are either learning how to cope with or some of the senses are disappearing so as soon as there is this representation of it through sugar like cake like aesthetic of course it directly falls into this childish um representation even such a heavy topic yoko that you're dealing with and this atomic cake which is shocking today to see that but a representation of it immediately makes it slightly more sweet and uh, bearable maybe i can say but i think there is this relationship not only between the memory and uh, the, the, the bitterness, but also learning and experience. The, the bitter memories, bitter learning sort of uh, create some sort of perhaps openness for expecting more and maybe enjoying. I know with Rosa and I, this idea of coming back to the intersection of food has just been a powerful artistic mo uh, like moment, but also a way to kind of understand these processes. Because with space issues, we're thinking about what it means to be able to construct and deconstruct something through the act of eating, which really inspires me thinking of Ezra's work of what it means to, and I'd love if you could speak on what it means to, you know, take a monument and the meanings behind it and turn it into this edible material and what that means what we honor and what these monuments mean. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I think there's something really interesting about taking a monument that, I mean, I took the monuments that like very historical for architects um, and then turning to a, something colorful and cute. Um, I'm like, I'm like always because the, the architecture history is built by men also and then taking and making it cute that I personally get like pleasure of. Um, and I always like ask the question like what they would think, but maybe who cares what they think, but maybe that's one, that's the next step I need to be, I need to figure out. But um, yeah, exactly. Like just taking something that it's, done there aggressively uh, and uh, showing the different type of history and this like um, yeah like very manly masculine forms and then making them not cuter and not the, the more 
feminine or, or like how I like, but also eating them, I think it's kind of quite powerful, even though they look cute, but I think there's something very bitter behind it. Mm -hmm. I also just want to say I love your exploration of monuments at a time when a lot are being taken down and it does feel um, like there's something there, a conversation there about, yeah, who gets authorship to build them, to create them, you know, and take them down. Yes, ex exactly. I think there's something to say about like how our environments are built by these very star just one person name, but we know that our environment is built by group of people that, but we only hear one man name, but then how can we um, change that, I guess? Yeah. And it's connection to history, mentioning the taking down the monuments. Uh, I think it's a great moment to look at it. I'm truly curious about how the works are going to evolve, especially until October. I'm sure they will also continue. These are, uh, you know, a number of research that require further time and exploration. But until October, they will have new shapes and new forms, I believe. Um, perhaps it is a good moment to wrap up if there are no further questions. I would like to tell to all the um, uh, participants here that um, uh, we put the biographies of each artist on the chat for you to find them easily but you can easily go to the Residency Unlimited website and, and find the artists. We did not inform about each of them one by one. Thank you so much uh, to the artists. Thank you so much for you at the audience for joining us. Um, and last few words, yes, Rosa? Thank you to you, Livia and Ishin as well, because you, know, you. you organized and put it all together. So, and we've had just, you know, bringing all the speakers in, it's just been such a wonderful wild ride. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you so much. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone again at our October event. So have a good night. Thank you. Have a good night.